Holy cow, these Zack Snyder fans are touchy. I All I said was that I don't really like any of Zack Snyder's superhero movies. I didn't like Sucker Punch either. Uh, and I am swarmed with Zack Snyder fans who are more devoted, more energized, uh, and more thin-skinned, sorry guys, uh, than even Brie Larson's fans, as I pointed out. When I said, wow, uh, Zack Snyder fans are more crazy than Brie Larson fans, they said, oh, so now you're acting like a victim, man. <laughs> Now you're a victim. Here comes the victim card. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm fascinated by all of this stuff and perfectly willing to listen to everyone's point of view. So uh, I was directed by one of them to this thread by a guy named Bat Kilmer. Uh, and uh, this is the ultimate Jeff Johns perfidy thread. Uh, it's all about his interference in DCEU movies, from what I understand. Uh, and as somebody who is not educated on this subject, I'm going to read it and react to it live. Uh, in this video, not really live, I'm taping it, but this is going to be, I haven't read it yet, and so I'm going to react to it in this video, because we need to do a video today. Um, all right, so welcome to Comic Artist Pro's Secrets. We should get that out of the way. My name's Ethan Van Skyver, 28-year veteran of the comic book industry, and before I hit send on this message, which says, okay, Zack Snyder bronies, I'm making a video on this thread. I haven't read it yet, but I was directed to it in order to educate myself on the perfidy of Jeff. I will make a reaction video to the things I learned herein. Uh, before I hit send on this, if you guys would be so kind uh, as to um, like, share this video, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell for notifications. Uh, we love you around here. I want you to join this channel. You may not always agree with what I say, but uh, hopefully I make it entertaining and you'll want to react to it. So here we go. Tweet. Boom. So here's the thread. Uh, here's Jeff Johns. Look at him there in his baseball cap, sunglasses, a t-shirt, man of the people. Uh, and as we can see, this is a this is an extremely popular. This is why I decided to do the video. I, I looked at the stats on this uh, tweet thread and went, "Wow, 153 quote th uh, tweets, 1.2 thousand likes." Uh, this is people reacted to this. People had a strong reaction to it. Uh, and so I'm gonna scroll down here. Here we go. Uh, before Green Lantern shills hop on my nuts uh, about this. Uh, I'm going to be as objective as possible and back myself with facts and evidence. Uh, all right, so here's Jeff. What's he saying here? Uh, had to stop it. There is nothing more important to me than a new DC Superman movie. Yes. How do you feel about that statement? I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I know, and, and look, working with Walter uh, Hamad and Toby over there, pictures, they feel the same way. All right, that seemed like a company man answer from Jeff. I don't know if Jeff feels like Superman uh, was ever the most important thing, the thing that he wanted to get done the most, especially since the definitive Superman movies were already done by his uh, uh, the guy who uh, schooled him, you know. Uh, so Richard Donner. So I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know why he said. I guess just because this guy said the most important thing to me. Uh, is a new Superman movie. You can't say, well, it isn't that important. It's the most important thing to this guy. Why would you deny this guy the most important thing in his life? All right, so we scroll down. Even as early as back in 2011, 2012, when Man of Steel was in production, Johns had tried intervening and taking it to the higher-ups regarding his concerns on the direction of the film, but was ignored. So we got this here. Uh, zoom out. Uh, Jeff Johns and Diane Nelson were reading scripts, and Jeff Johns, to his credit was concerned that there was not enough lightness or humor uh, given who the character is, recalled the source. Jeff definitely raised that point, but that current administration didn't care much about what Jeff thought. Mm, okay, so early on, Jeff had the title of Chief Creative Officer. Uh, and I think the, the whole thing that Jeff was supposed to do, uh, they gave him that job so that he could make sure that the movies were in line with what was going on in the comics. And Jeff has this encyclopedic knowledge of superheroes, of DC Comics superheroes. He knows them all. For the most part, Jeff Johns writes the very best take on these characters in the comic books. Uh, so uh, they sent him over there. And I guess he read Man of Steel uh, and thought it was too dark and gloomy. And I gotta say, you know, Jeff is somebody who doesn't shy away from darkness or gloominess. We did a book called Flash Iron Heights that was really bleak. I mean, it was uh, a horror story, uh, you know, involving the Flash, who's normally seen as a very light and happy character. 
Um, so whatever Jeff was reading in the Man of Steel, I think he just thought it was going the wrong direction. They were going the grim, dark avenue with a character who should be a little bit more like uh, Jeff's mentor, Richard Donner's version of Superman. I think that's probably where he was going. So Jeff tried to interfere. Jeff tried to um, not interfere, it doesn't look like. He was just, uh, hey, this is getting a little bit gloomy here. And everyone ignored him. All right, so scrolling down some more. Uh, a lot of the change and shift in direction on part of John seemingly happened after he became DC president. Uh, in the post-production of Suicide Squad, Johns came and worked in the editing room for that film, which broke Iyer's timeline, like Harley being responsible for the death of Robin. Uh, let me see. Yes, that broke my timeline. Johns added it. Wow, that's pretty direct. Uh, this guy, DC Connection, says, I think that text was added in later by editors who didn't get the full story. Uh, the backstory behind his teeth makes Harley being an accomplice impossible. Yeah. All right, so David Iyer here is actually saying, yeah, this, you know, Jeff Johns added something to my movie, which broke the timeline of my story. Uh, you know, the fact that he would say that means he's pretty pissed off. He rewrote pages on the fly for Iyer to reshoot when the film had already wrapped filming with the knee-jerk reaction by Warner Brothers at the time, which minimized and cut down a lot of what David filmed. Um, he says, all right, so this guy says, just goes to show how influential to the final cut those music trailers were. For sure, says David Iyer, that became a factor, but the reason was Batman versus Superman got chewed up by the critics and the success of Deadpool, uh, the studio leadership at the time panicked. Then major elements of my cut were ripped out before I could mature the edit. Then Jeff Johns wrote pages I had to reshoot. Okay, so uh, yeah, so David, I guess David was going the dark, a dark, uh, you know, kind of a grim, dark way with Suicide Squad. And uh, when people saw that everyone hated, the critics hated Batman versus Superman. And I hated it too. I just didn't like it. I'm sorry. Uh, and then you had Deadpool, which is almost effortlessly uh, fun. You know, most of the Marvel movies are. They're just fun. They're lightweight. Even though Marvel is seen as the darker of the two publishing houses with the grimmer, you know, the... They've got the Punisher, they've got Wolverine, the X-Men, they've got Ghost Rider, they've got all these characters that, you know, inhabit and live in the darkness. Definitely DC has Batman and the entire Gotham, world of Gotham should be grim dark. Uh, but when you're doing Superman and, and stuff like that, eh, it should be a little bit more fun. And it's a wonder why the DCEU can't just lighten up and produce a movie that is as uh, entertaining and fun I keep saying fun, but I mean, that, that is the defining word. I didn't find Batman versus Superman to be fun at all. I thought it was a chore. I thought it was a slog. So, you know, critics are saying they really like Deadpool because it's fun and funny. It's still violent. It's, you know, rated, I guess that was rated R, but it, it's a good time. And, and, you know, we're worried that Suicide Squad is going to match the tone of Batman v Superman and flop uh, when it should match the tone of Deadpool. And then Jeff came in and wrote some pages to lighten it up. That's got to be frustrating. This guy just, this guy is not happy about that. You can tell that he is, he's not happy about that. Uh, another known instance was Rick uh, Femiyua. I don't know this guy, who at the time was hired to direct Flash. Uh, it said uh, that he wanted real world, world politics, which were deemed too edgy by the current regime. So we click on this. I've heard the director Femiyua. I hope I'm pronouncing that close to right, saw an opportunity to introduce more racial and social themes into the Flash cyborg dynamic and the youth culture of the film. But Warner Brothers didn't want it to go so far in that direction. Racial and social themes sounds like uh, SJW stuff. Um, Warner Brothers didn't want to go in that direction. They feared it didn't get close enough to the fun-loving, humorous approach they wanted for the project. Uh, to be sure, Femi Yiwa's uh, vision included humor and a young generational perspective uh, to the themes, but in a different way than precisely what Warner expected. On their end, Warner wasn't against drama and seriousness. They simply have a plan in mind for a specific approach to the movie. Hmm, another thing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Crudup's uh, in important roles. Uh, sources told The Hollywood Reporter that the director wanted the movie uh, to have more edge, and that clashed with the studio's take. Uh, all right. 
So, uh, no, they they wanted it to just be fun. And it, again, it wasn't fun. Everybody is just, it's got to have social and racial themes. Um, this lines up with the clear mandate uh, the, uh, of Jeff Johns, making it clear uh, that he was pushing aggressively for a DC universe with hope and optimism. Yes, what's so wrong with that? Uh, at the time of him being promoted to DC president. You know, I, I remember this. I remember when he, you know, did his rebirth initiative for DC. He just said DC Comics lost its smile. Uh, it sh they should all be avatars for hope, you know, and, and they're not right now. They're gloomy. Uh, Jeff's success with the DC rebirth comic book line uh, was, I guess, in stark contrast. He, you know, he, he was able to tell uh, everyone at DC Comics, the publishing line, what to do and, and create and implement a clear direction towards more positivity and, and the importance of the relationships within the comics. He used to have writer, uh, writer's meetings. I, was, I, I, I went to see him at the DC offices back in 15 or 16, 2016, and he showed me around. He showed me like he had a conference room where he had a, a big uh, marker board uh, on on one wall that had all of the books and breaking it down to you know what the what the singular story flow was going to be for DC Comics, and he had the writers come in and actually workshop them. So he was always he was very hands on. Uh, now that approach didn't seem to be as appreciated in Hollywood, evidently, as Jeff tries to workshop uh, creative people who work in in the movies rather than in comics. And I mean, look, comic book people have egos, but I got to say, uh, probably not to the same degree as filmmakers. Uh, so here we go. Jeff Johns uh, aims to bring hope and optimism to DC brand. Uh, newly appointed DC Films head Jeff Johns speaks to, to his intention to bring hope and optimism to the DC brand through the DCEU. So, I mean, that's a clear conflict with what Zack Snyder was trying to do. And what a lot of these other guys were trying to do, right? I mean, you know, they, they weren't really looking to bring hope and optimism to their films. They were looking to bring realism, you know, a real world edge to characters like Superman and Batman. Uh, all right. It says, I want, also want to point out that Fama Yiwa was directed, uh, was hired to direct The Flash a month before Jeff Johns had been promoted to DC president. F uh, Flash is Jeff's character, man. Jeff really cares about The Flash. Flash movie lands dope. Dope director Rick Famiyiwa here. So uh, that's good. And then you see uh, July 27th, 2016, Jeff Johns confirmed uh, as president of DC Entertainment. So I guess like, you know, that's it. Like at that point, uh, Jeff was going to make some changes there. Yeah, a month before. He was hired a month before. So Jeff, what are they saying? Jeff uh, got this guy fired. Jeff Johns even admitted to pushing his perspective on DC characters uh, to filmmakers and how his writing of these characters gave him credibility. Oh boy, here we go. Here we got a big paragraph. Uh, I work with so many talented people. This is Jeff Johns talking. So there's people that love it and understand it and embrace it. And there's people that don't know that uh, and you want to help them learn it. And you want to tell them why a certain storyline for a certain character might not work or why a take on a character might not work, or what Superman really should be. Uh, but the whole thing is to craft and shape a story uh, to fit the character, the story and the tone to fit the character, and to celebrate the character instead of deconstruct the character. I think you want to celebrate the character because you've got to celebrate something and build it up, I think, to really make it into something that represents who that character truly is. Yeah, this is the guy I know. Uh, and also, the fact that I've written all these comic books gives me a lot of credibility coming into the room because it's hard to argue sometimes. Like, people can tell me what Aquaman is, but if, if I've written the book, literally, it helps me out. Uh, so, <laughs> so Jeff is in there saying, I wrote the comic book. You guys can't tell me what you think Aquaman is. You're talking to the guy who writes who writes the comic book Aquaman, uh, which is true. Uh, Femi Yiwa also threw shade to the regime when the Black Panther numbers came out and the Justice League was a financial disaster. So this guy's unhappy. Black Panther to top Justice League, total U.S. box office in just four days. Black Panther was, uh, I mean, you could tell that movie was going to be a hit. Once again, it's Marvel. It's just effortless, effortlessly fun. And I wish there were a formula that, you know, could be duplicated, but 
Uh, well, there is. I mean, you know, the MCU duplicates it over and over and over again. Every single MCU movie, except for Captain Marvel, has been a blast. Black Panther makes Justice League its prey at the box office. Uh, and look at this. There you go. Liked. <laughs> he liked it. Frog Coffee. I like this guy. He likes frogs. He's also a frog connoisseur like myself. Uh, all right. It's also interesting to note uh, that Black Panther got critical praise for its themes. Uh, whereas he wasn't allowed to explore those same themes on The Flash. Uh, it was even scheduled to release weeks after Black Panther in March uh, 2018. So in other words, um, look, Black Panther did it. But I mean, of course, Black Panther is going to be that way. Black Panther is about, uh, you know, being black. You know, it's about um, black strength. And uh, that that's kind of what it what it how do you write a Black Panther movie that doesn't have those themes in it? It's impossible. On the other hand, Flash and a Flash and Cyborg movie doesn't necessarily lend itself to those themes. Uh, and that I think is the, is the difference. It could work. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't work. I'm just saying that, uh, this is not really a fair comparison. Um, although, uh, what they're also saying here is that Black Panther could have led the way, uh, and people could have been thirsty for movies with more themes like that, and Flash Cyborg could have, could have been there. Uh, on Aquaman, James Wan was hired and had originally pitched it as a horror film inspired by John Carpenter and James Cameron, which didn't reflect the final product aside from a sequence. So James Wan wanted Aquaman to be a horror monster movie. Damn, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. I, you know what? I'm the same way with Aquaman. I feel the same way about that character. You know, the whole thing about Aquaman is just how weird it is. Like, like the deepest part of the ocean should be as foreign and strange as, you know, the furthest reaches of the universe. You know, we don't go down there. We don't know what it's like to be down there. That, that, could, that whole world down there the, of Atlantis, you know, where all these characters, uh, where human beings, there's a certain kind of human being that can actually live and, and is strong enough to survive all that pressure and, and breathe. I mean, that's cool as hell. And then to think that like all of the sea monsters that people believed in way back in the early days of traversing the seas from, you know, doing trading and you know, here, the, here lies, here there be monsters. Damn, that could have been cool. I, I resent this, that this didn't happen. Uh, instead, oh, look at how little James Wan is. Hold on, let me see. Pause. All right, boom. Opportunity to uh, explore this universe, you know, bring a bit of my horror element into this, the deep sea, the scary world, and then also explore the uh, the wondrous element of Atlantis. That's that's all I have to say. Opportunity okay, to uh, uh, explore. We one hundred percent agree, man. We are we're on the same track. Uh, I was offered Aquaman. Um, I think like. January of 2006, or no, December of 2016. Was that when it was, or was it 17? Anyway, uh, after Green Lantern, that DC offered me Aquaman. They, they wanted to know if I had a pitch, and it sounded very much like James Wan's pitch here. And uh, boy, uh, it's a shame. I would love to see this. John's pushed for Black Manta, which Wan wasn't sure would work and wasn't sure about including in the film. John's explained... There was a moment when the script was really going and director uh, James Wan texted me or emailed me and said, Black Manta's story may be too big for this movie. I just went to his office and I said, Black Manta has to be in the movie. He was like, I know. Um, so it, that does sound a little bit like <laughs> James Wan was kind of bullied into putting Black Manta in this movie. But I mean, Black Manta is Aquaman's biggest arch enemy. And so you would think if you were making a DC Comics version of an Aquaman movie, Black Manta would have to be in it. But on the other hand, you know, maybe James was saying that we could have built up to it. You know, start out doing this scary underwater world uh, that Aquaman inhabits and then later bring out Black Manta. All right, I don't know. He says, now on to Justice League. There were reports which confirmed that Jeff Johns was rewriting pages on the fly which even annoyed Chris Terrio. Says, I remember hearing that Jeff Johns rewrote so much of Justice League when Zack Snyder was still directing that Chris Terrio would complain. Maybe try using some of my pages, wrote Vulture uh, Senior Editor Kyle Buchanan on Twitter. Yikes. Zack Snyder even confirmed there were scenes and lines he was forced to shoot 
which he is now cutting out and replacing with scenes he shot simultaneously from his original script. Uh, so, okay. Wow, Zack Snyder was uh, uh, I, hanging out with these guys on a live stream. Let's see what this is. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, is there something you shot originally that you're not going to include in the movie? You know, some a line or some joke scene? Absolutely. That... Absolutely. <laughs> There's okay. plenty of things that I was like, thank God I can get this out. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, I wanted to. All right. Ask... So uh, that reaction from Zack Snyder means that, like, he it seems like it, he's saying he felt uh, a little bit suppressed, and he had a lot of things that he wanted to say and do with the Justice League movie uh, that he didn't get to do. So we're gonna see all that stuff in the Snyder cut. Uh, Jay Oliva Oliva even came in during production to help with storyboarding action scenes, uh, which was met with pushback from Johns. Let me get this to the beginning. The that I, Here we go. The sequence that I was kind of doing, which was the Themyscira stuff on Justice League, I remember I added some stuff, and and there were, and I remember Jeff John was there, and I was having dinner with Jeff Johns, and he's like, he's like, he's like, I don't think we need this, and I told Jeff like, no, it'll be cool. Trust me, it'll be really cool if we, you know, I was like, it, 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 it it's gonna be something cool visually, um, but. You know, I remember that like there were more execs involved and more kind of studio involvement when I was working on the later films than than in that first one. That first one for me was like magic. The single Wow, okay. So uh this guy storyboard artist, director and storyboard artist. Uh he was uh doing some Themyscira scenes. Skyra, Themyscira. And uh Jeff said cut him out. Uh, in regards to Whedon's involvement in Justice League, Johns admitted that he got uh, Joss on board to help write scenes for Justice League even prior to Zack's departure, when Joss was only involved in Batgirl around the time. Uh, oh yeah, I heard about this. I heard, you know, uh, that this was the case. Like, Joss Whedon was totally Jeff's idea and all that. Um, Alright, there were internal discussions about how to revamp parts of the movie. Johnson Berg mulled the idea of having someone other than Snyder write new scenes for the film. By coincidence, uh, the writer director of Marvel's Avengers, uh, Joss Whedon, met with Johnson Berg to discuss creating a movie with them. The pair were game for that. They eventually chose one about Batman ally Batgirl, but later realized they could accomplish another goal. Everyone was excited about Joss being a part of DC, and we thought he'd be great to write the, ju write the Justice League scenes. Wrong. The additional photography scenes that we wanted to get, Johns recalls. So I guess Joss Whedon probably wrote Booyah for Cyborg, and that's probably why Ray Fisher did not want to say Booyah out of respect for whatever Zack Snyder was going through at the time, uh, his uh, his whole thing. At Justice Con, let me get this to the beginning. Who's going to step? Hold on, hold on. At Justice Con, Zack even said himself he wasn't involved in picking Joss to take over, completely contradicting reports that Zack handpicked him to finish it. So I guess there was word that Zack Snyder handpicked Joss Whedon to be his replacement, and evidently that's a lie. Who's going to step away? Yeah, when you stepped away for a little bit, was that your call to let someone else I, step in? Or well, it certainly was... It certainly was our decision to leave the movie, you right. know, in, in the in the light of what happened. Um, of course. So, you know, and was it specifically our call on who would do it and all that? And it was a it was before the committee, you know, it was a, it was a thing that was sort of a general. It was a right. company decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a we were pretty um, distracted. At of course. Right. Yeah, I'll bet you were. That's awful. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, evidently, uh, you know, Zack Snyder had to step away. Family tragedy. Joss Whedon was already there. He was already writing lines of dialogue for Justice League. And uh, he got implemented to take over for Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder did not choose him. Uh, the studio chose him. Uh, Whedon was even said to be John's secret weapon when working on Justice League. Uh, so what accounts for... Uh, the contrasting reputations. Perhaps part of the problem is that the movies until recently had very little influence from the core DC entertainment team who had done so well elsewhere. Quote, it took some work for us to earn our stripes, I think, with the rest of the studio and the filmmakers, says the company's boyish chief creative officer, Jeff Johns, uh, sitting at a table with a bunch of DC executives in San Diego. Uh, here's Diane Nelson. She goes, it's not chaos. It's, it's intentional. She says, we know what we're doing. 
All right, so the picture's becoming pretty clear here. I mean, I, I remember Jeff getting hired to be chief creative officer, and his job uh, was basically just to make sure that the stuff that Warner Brothers was putting out about DC, the DCEU stuff, would be consistent with what these characters actually uh, are in the comics. And it sounds like that job uh, meant that Jeff Johns was going to have to butt heads with creative people who weren't there to, I mean, you know, none of these, none of these filmmakers were there to take a comic book and put it on screen. And that was the problem right out of the bat. That seems to be uh, the source of all of this chaos. None of these creative people went, oh yeah, uh, you know, the Joker, I want to just do a Joker movie that is exactly like, you know, what people were reading in, uh, you know, Batman comics in the 1970s. Nobody thought that. Everybody, every creative person likes to take these ideas and make them into something that is unique and their own. And then you're struggling with Jeff Johns and you're struggling with Diane Nelson who are saying, no, make a company, make a corporate product, make something that reflects what the publishing is doing. Uh, and uh, that was that was Jeff's job. That was Jeff's job to do that. Um, all right, so here we are. When Zach was interviewed in early 2020 for a book, there were two topics he chose not to discuss. And he says, and this is where I'll leave it. Uh oh, okay. So this is the last uh, item here. Let's find out. There were two topics that he would not discuss uh, with me because I had to get all these questions pre approved. The first topic was whether or not this was uh, closure for him. Uh, whether he's, this is a one and done, I'm just going to finish my Justice League vision and, and I'm going to deliver it and that will be it. Uh, or whether he plans to continue, because that's absolutely a topic that I wanted to discuss with him. And the second topic that he would not discuss was Jeff Johns. And that's what I was There were two topics. Oh, damn, dude. All right, so Zack Snyder is just like, look, you know, I don't want to talk about this. And the other thing I don't want to talk about is Jeff Johns. So don't ask me. That means that, uh, well, I mean, you want to think that that means that, you know, Jeff Johns is somebody who uh, Zack Snyder has hard feelings about. Uh, and uh, I guess one can kind of understand if you're following the thread of this, uh, what the uh, what the problem with Jeff is. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I think that Jeff Johns probably thought he was doing his job, which was to ensure the integrity of these characters as they appear in other media. Uh, and that's that was his job, that's why they hired him, that's where they put him where he is. Uh, and yet he seems to have estranged and annoyed almost everyone, including Diane Nelson, who said, you know, as she uh, was asked about Jeff Johns a year after she was fired, she said, he's no friend of mine, or he's not my pal, or something like that, which is, you know, pretty crazy. Uh, so. Uh, this is where we are. It, it seems like, uh, you know, Jeff's intentions were to protect DC Comics characters, but that made him butt heads with other creative people, other artists. And because he came from the comic book industry, which is not respected in Hollywood, uh, he was, a you know, the biggest fish in a small pond in, in comics, and then a tiny little fish in an enormous pond in Hollywood. And yet, uh, it sounds like he uh, butted heads. He pushed some people around uh, in order to protect these DC characters. So I get it. I understand why people are angry. Uh, and that just makes me kind of say, yeah, I'm curious about the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. Do I, do I think I'm going to like it? No, I just, I still don't. You know, even um, your unfiltered, un, unimpeded Zack Snyder making movies, uh, it's, it's not going to make much of a difference to the final product. I think his, uh, Jeff Johns is 100% right that this guy, uh, and every other filmmaker almost, it seems that, that Jeff has encountered or worked with in Hollywood has a very dark and bleak vision. Um, on the one hand though, when you leave these guys alone, they create a masterpiece like the Joker movie, which was nothing like the Joker, uh, and yet so timely, so relevant and such a good quality film. Uh, sometimes, uh, and in fact, all the time, uh, it's a good idea to let creative people do what they want to do. Uh, you hired them. And since you hired them, that implies that you trust them. You have some faith that, you know, their vision is 
is what's going to uh, is what needs to come across on the screen rather than some kind of strange corporate stone soup and just making sure that everything uh, on the screen matches what is uh, necessarily in these colorful like these four color newsprint comic book pamphlets uh, which are you know <laughs> let's face it they're for kids this is a new version this is you when you're creating a movie uh, based on any of these characters it should be a new version um but there's a compromise you know there's got to be a compromise where you know superman doesn't have to be grim dark anyway fascinating thread thank you for it i hope uh, it wasn't too boring to listen to me react to it um but uh yeah i, I wanted to uh i wanted to respond to it as i read it for the first time and uh, i feel enlightened how do you like that i feel like i learned a little something did you let me know what you think in the comments below uh, i read all your comments i click little hearts on them when they stand out when they're special subscribe to this channel please ring the bell for notifications and i'll see you again soon with another video new from all caps comics rainbow the brute the last real man in fairyland a tale of prismatic pain a spectrum of brutality and a pretty good dad Choke slam a unicorn by backing it today, only on Indiegogo. New from All Caps Comics, Snowman, a cold day in hell. The victim of a genocidal massacre has somehow returned from the dead and is carving a path of death across the heart of America. Driven by the echoes of silent screams, this is the story of a man once known as Black Dog, the one now forever known as the Snowman. Snowman, a cold day in hell, back it today, only on Indiegogo.